Hi, I'm going to talk today about the unconscious mind and how it affects your behavior and your perception of the world, especially the social world. So I should start by defining what I mean by the unconscious. And what scientists today mean by unconscious processes are processes that occur, first of all, with no effort on your part, or at least no conscious effort, and they're automatic, you're not aware of them, you don't need any willpower to create them, and they're more or less beyond your control. As a result, we don't really understand what's influencing us in many ways, and we often can't avoid the behaviors that it produces. But this is not the Freudian unconscious, so let me make that clear, that the Freudian unconscious is a concept of the unconscious that is hidden from you for motivational or emotional reasons. And it can be revealed through introspection or through therapy, but the modern idea of the unconscious is much different from that. It's something that evolved evolutionarily to help us navigate our, our world, our perceptual world and our social world, and it takes place in parts of your brain that are inherently inaccessible to your conscious mind. And the field that I'm going to talk about is called social neuroscience. And social neuroscience is really a combination of three fields. Uh, traditionally, we have social psychology, which is a field of how the psychology of how people uh, interact with each other, and cognitive psychology, which is the science of how we think. But in the mid-1990s, a new field uh, grew up called neuroscience. And neuroscience is largely based on a new technology, uh, many new technologies, but in particular, one has been dominant, and that's called fMRI, or functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is a bit of a mouthful, but you may have, uh, be familiar with MRI from medical testing, which gives you a, a nice image of your internal organs. Well, fMRI has that word functional in front of it because it also tells, when you do it of the brain, what part of the brain is at work. Here you can see, for instance. And this has, uh, has totally revolutionized psychology because the modern social neuroscience or psychology that's grown up from this is not only based on studies of behavior, but connects those studies to what's going on in the brain. So it makes the concepts much more concrete and makes it into much more of a hard science. Let me give you one example of fMRI and how it works, or uh, the results it can achieve. This was a study done at Berkeley where subjects were shown different slides, and you can see four of the slides here. And these subjects were looking at these slides on goggles while they were laying in an fMRI machine. And the, the scientists took the data from their brain, not the data from the slides, but purely the readings from their brain, from their visual cortex and from other parts of the brain that were related to the thematic uh, nature of what they were seeing, and they asked the computer to reconstruct uh, the slides that the people were seeing, a kind of mind reading. And the computer took all this data and then looked at a database that it had of six million images and picked the ones that were closest. And as you can see here, it was very close, not just in the layout and the uh, physical data of the slides, but thematically, it was uh, really a kind of mind reading. So what I'm going to talk about today are really uh, the, the unconscious mind in two areas. One is our physical perception, and the other is our social perception. Now, my real point here is that we create our image of other people, of situations, social situations, business, financial situations, uh, using not only our conscious thought, but our unconscious mind. But I'm going to start by illustrating that in sensory perception, partly because sensory perception is much more dramatic and easy to illustrate in a talk like this, and partly because of the ways that we reconstruct reality from limited data are analogous in sensory perception and in social perception. And I want you to come away thinking that our perceptions, both our visual, our, our auditory perceptions, uh, and our memories, and our social perceptions are all not literally what's out there, but there's something constructed by our brain from what's really out there, plus many other things, such as context, expectation, and even uh, desire. And I want you to come away thinking that the way we experience the world is largely driven by these unconscious processing. Here's an example. This is uh, what you perceive when you look at a road, let's say. Now, this is not really what's hitting your retina. The data that's hitting your retina is really much more fuzzy. It looks like this. The uh, yellow dot has been added just to show where the person was looking at. But the black dot wasn't added. The black dot is where the optic nerve attaches to the retina, and there's no data at all. So your eye takes this kind of fuzzy data, and without any effort, and automatically, and without any control on your part, turns it into that, into something that's very clear. Let me illustrate that uh, uh, more specifically with this slide. If you look at this, you see a checkerboard, and you probably see the rectangle with the B in it, it looks like a white square, and the rectangle with the A in it looks like a black square. But I'm going to tell you right now, the truth is that A and B are identical. So the actual physical light that is emanating from A and B that you're seeing on the screen are identical. Uh, the, the square B is the same color as the square A. So I want you to have your try and have your conscious mind override that. I said it's automatic. 
and you can't control it, I want you to look at that and see B as the same color as A. And you'll find that you can't do that. Now, why do you see B as being lighter than A? It's the context. Your unconscious mind is taking the context of this photo and making, the t making you see the square B as a white square and A as a black square. And you can call that an optical illusion, but it's a gift to you because you really don't want to go through life taking in the actual literal physical data and stopping every few seconds to figure out what it means and to reconstruct this pattern from the data of light and dark that's there. Now, in case you don't trust me and you think I'm just making this up, let me take the context away. So watch the screen, and you'll see what happens to A and B when I pull the, the context of the checkerboard away. So now, without the context, you can see that A and B are the same. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, I, I could if I had more than 18 minutes, but I can't. So this is a picture of uh, Barack Obama, who you may recognize. And this is to illustrate the social component of your, of your mental processing. When you look at these two pictures of Obama, they probably both look like Obama upside down and fairly normal. But your social, our social perceptions, our social interactions are extremely important to us. And so our brain operates largely to help us with our social perception. And uh, these pictures are actually very different. They're not really very similar. But your social uh, perception is not really working at full speed because he's upside down. And we're not made to see people upside down. Maybe if you're a yoga instructor and you stand on your head. But most of us don't see people upside down, so we don't really notice that. But look what happens when I turn him over. So if you were to see this fellow on the street, you go, whoa, <laughs> looks a little like Obama, but something happened. And, if he's <laughs> and maybe that'll have how I look after the election race. But <laughs> if, if, if you see this fellow, you'll see a normal human being. Well, now, now the social part of your brain is, is interpreting this for you, and it's doing it automatically. Let me, let me turn him over again and see what happens. So you see how that works? The effect kind of disappears when he's upside down and comes back when he's right side up. <laughs> now let me show you some, uh, another example in hearing, just to show you that this is not just uh, the way that our visual processing works, but our, our hearing is also, we take the auditory data that comes into our ears, and just as our brain plays games with us to construct an image and vision, it does the same thing in audio. Uh, listen to this song. You may, some of you may recognize it's by Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven, and it's not playing. One more time. Okay, so... This song probably sounds pretty normal to you, and you can decode mentally the eight or ten lines that are here in the song played forward. And now, in a second, I'm going to play it for you backwards, okay? And I want you to listen to it backwards. I want you to see if, um, is Led Zeppelin clever enough to create an audio file that, that makes sense both forwards and when played backwards? So now you heard about eight or ten lines of the song played backwards, and you think you could, if I gave you paper, you could write down the, the, the lines? It's, or does it sound like gibberish? So I think it sounds to, to people like gibberish, and, and this is because it really is gibberish. But this gibberish that, that comes into your brain can be transformed into something by helping your, your unconscious mind have a little context. So I'm going to play you some, I'm going to play it again with some words. And just as uh, the, the checkerboard looked different when I took the squares away and put them in the context, this song is going to sound different to you backwards now that I play that with the context. So please read along. So now you have two versions of reality. Now the physics of it is the same. You had the same audio the first time and this time, but your perception is totally different because now your mind has taken this and constructed something out of it. Now just to show you again that it's automatic and you can't avoid it, and I'm sure you, you understand that it's been effortless, 
Uh, I'm going to play it for you again. I want you to watch the words again, listen to it, but I want you to hear it the way you heard it the first time and not, uh, not hear the words, just hear the gibberish, okay? So you couldn't avoid it now because once you've heard it, you're spoiled. And because of this, some people actually uh, think they're hearing messages, subliminal messages in backwards song, but it's not really there. And if you go to skeptics.com or Michael Shermer's group, you can see uh, some discussions about, about how this is uh, really false. What I want to get on to now, I want to go to social perception. And because the point of this is that all these same tricks that your mind plays to create our visual and our auditory perception also work in social perception. And one of the things our brains use to create, uh, to create a social perception and image is appearance. Now, people are inherently very social animals. We couldn't have survived as a species without social cooperation. And indeed, when scientists study it today, they find that people with a low uh, amount of social contacts, with a small social network, are, are at much higher health risks than people who have a, a large social network. In fact, having a, a, a very small social network is as big a health risk as uh, heavy smoking or obesity. And in this study, scientists gathered together people, two groups of people, and they showed them political data on two candidates, a Republican and a Democrat. And the data was not only pure data on what they believed, but also a picture of the two, of each candidate. And to one group, they showed the Democrat in a, in a photo that looked more competent, and the Republican in a less competent, less flattering photo, and in the other group, they switched it. Now, I don't mean beauty, I mean look of competence. So the only difference between the two groups was they were seeing, they were seeing the same data, but a different uh, view of the candidate. And the question was, how much does this affect their voting? And the, the answer is, uh, the, it amounted to a vote swing of 14%. So by switching the photos to being more competent versus less, it was a 14% vote swing, which is enough to swing most elections, and that's very dramatic evidence. But of course, it was in the laboratory, so what about the real world? Fortunately, uh, a psychologist at Princeton University decided to test this out in the real world, and he gathered pairs of uh, headshots of the Democrat and the Republican candidates in dozens of races for governorships and for Congress. And he brought hundreds of people into the laboratory, and he showed them these pairs of photos and asked them purely to judge which person looked more competent in each case. And he told them, if you recognize one of the candidates, don't vote. This is purely, uh, we're just looking at these photos of people and picking who looks more competent. And then he took a bold step, and he predicted the outcome of each of these elections based purely on who was voted more competent looking. And the question is, how successful was he? If competence had no effect, he would be 50% successful, but he was 70% successful. So 70% of the cases, the more competent looking person won the election. Another thing that our uh, brains use, our unconscious minds, to fill in our social perception is touch. I said that people are inherently very social animals, and in fact, all these primates, there's here I'm showing four different kinds of primates engaged in social, <laughs> in social touching behavior, and uh, the non-human primates tend to touch each other for hours a day. It's something that they need uh, physically to clean themselves, but that would be accomplished in 10 or 20 minutes a day, yet they touch each other for hours a day because touch helps create a sense of bonding and social cooperation. And in fact, scientists have recently found that people have specialized nerves, uh, especially in the forearms and the face, that seem to be there just to transmit the social pleasure of, of touching. So the question is, as we form our view of the world, what kind of context does this add? How does this affect our judgment of the world, whether or not we're being touched? And uh, so a group of French scientists, of course, did this interesting experiment. They hired uh, a few very handsome young Frenchmen to stand on a street corner in northern France and proposition all the single young women who walked by. So they, they stood there and, and they read the same script, this is the translation of the script, to all the women. They gave their name, they asked for the woman's phone number. But to half of the women, they gave a very light quarter or half second touch on the elbow or the shoulder. And to the other half, they didn't touch at all. And in exit interviews, because they intercepted the women later, most of them didn't even remember having been touched. But the question is, did this affect, this, this, this signal affect the context of how they viewed the person and, and the degree to which they would agree to a date? And the answer is yes, it doubled it from 10% to 20%. And this has been repeated in many other contexts. 
Uh, for instance, waiters get higher tips if they briefly touch the customers, and uh, people taking surveys get more, get more people to agree to take the survey on the street and take some time out, and in many other areas. Now, normally, uh, when I explain these ideas, I like to do a little experiment on the group, but this was not possible here, so I'll just tell you about the experiment. And the experiment is that I ask people to uh, look at these, this hotel room and this hotel, and I give them some data, I tell them it's in Tahiti, and it's a one-bedroom, uh, little one-bedroom cottage, etc. And I ask them what they would expect to pay for the, for the room in Tahiti. And I get very uh, dramatic uh, results, but I ask, uh, the first group, I, I divide them into two groups, and I ask the first group, before I ask them to tell me what the room costs, I ask them this question, does this room cost more than $5,500 a night? And the second group, before I ask them to rate what the room costs, I ask them this question, does it cost more than $55 a night? Now, from the data that they'd seen, it's pretty clear that the room is not $5,500 a night, not anywhere near that, and that it's a lot more than $55 a night. So you would think these are throwaway questions. But actually, this questions, exercise a certain subliminal effect on the audience. And, the ones who, and by the way, the ones who saw this question did not see this and vice versa. So they only saw the one that, um, that in the group that they assigned them to. And the question is, how does this context affect their actual assessment of the room, their perception of what that room is worth? And here's the answer from um, several groups that I've done. So typically, they'll guess around $1,000 uh, if they saw the higher question first and they'll guess around $200 to $300 if they saw the lower question. So this simple throwaway question provides the context that changes their perception of the room, just like the checkerboard provides the context and the words in the song provided, in the backward song provided the context. So let me just end the talk with this quote by Carl Jung. The subliminal aspects of everything that, hap that happens to us may seem to play little part in our daily lives, but they are the almost invisible roots of our conscious thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.